Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Susan Illion. Here's what's coming up on the program. Scores of people die after a boat carrying migrants capsizes off the coast of Cape Verde. Residents of the Pakistani city of Jaranwala still shocked after a Muslim mob vandalized and torched several churches. Plus, army chiefs in Ecowas say they stand ready to intervene militarily if diplomatic efforts fail to reverse the recent coup. At least 60 people are thought to have died after a boat carrying migrants was discovered off the coast of Cape Verde. Officials have once again renewed calls for global action on migration to help prevent loss of life. There is no specific count of the number of people who could have been on the boat when it capsized, but 38 people, including children, were rescued. Many of them helped ashore. Almost all those on board the boat, which was at sea for over a month, are thought to have been from Senegal. The vessel was spotted on Monday, according to police, but initial reports suggested the boat had sunk. It was later clarified that it had been found drifting. The wooden piroc style boat was seen almost 320 kilometers off Sal, one of the islands belonging to Cape Verde. It was seen by a Spanish boat, which then alerted authorities. Senegal's foreign ministry says the boat reportedly left the Senegalese fishing village of Fasboy on July 10, with 101 people on board. The ministry is liaison with authorities in Cape Verde to arrange the repatriation of Senegalese nationals. The passengers of other countries of origin include Sierra Leone and in one case Guinea-Bissau. Over in Cape Verde, a health official says the survivors are improving and are being looked after with a focus on rehydration and tests for conditions like malaria. Earlier, the Voice of America's African correspondent Miriam Diallo spoke to my colleague Anne Nwaguado about developments from the incident. About 100 uh, people uh, in that boat. At this point, it's not clear, uh, really. We don't have a lot of information about when, uh, you know, those nearly 60 people, uh, the missing 60 people, when that has happened, uh, when that occurred. Uh, and I think between what's strange is that basically uh, between Senegal and Cape Verde, it's not that far away. When you, uh, at least by plane, it takes about two hours. It's about 400, I think, and 20 miles, 460 miles. I'm not sure, some, somewhere in there. So on a direct flight, uh, you can fly from Dakar uh, to Cape Verde in two hours. Uh, Possibly when you are uh, sailing through the sea, it might take longer, but a whole month uh, and a week uh, seems uh, really very, very long. And as to what happened to the missing nearly 60, uh, obviously reports, there are reports that seven uh, people were found on the boat. Uh, the rest of them, nobody knows uh, now uh, at this point. But I think as the, the people who are being rescued uh, can rest and uh, regain their strength, uh, we'll probably hear the stories uh, coming out of what exactly happened in that boat. Over 100 migrants were in that boat. We understand that only 38 people have survived so far, but what more can you tell us regarding the missing people? Have they been found? What are authorities saying about this? Yeah, I think at this point, uh, given how new it is, uh, you know, the, the incident just has happened. Uh, there is not a lot of information that's coming out about those uh, nearly 60 uh, that are missing. Uh, again, and I think uh, that once we get to uh, uh, talking to the people that have been rescued and, one, uh, uh, and also once uh, uh, more search are, uh, is done around the area, at least 16, at least 10 people have been killed, including eight passengers and crew, as well as a motorcyclist and driver, after a private jet crashed into a road while attempting to land in Malaysia. The Civil Aviation Authority has not confirmed the death toll, but police say the aircraft lost contact with the air traffic control tower two minutes before it was due to touch down at the city's Sultan Abdul Aziz Shah Airport. One eyewitness says he had been working on site as an engineer when he heard an explosion. He went to where the crash happened and saw injured people. The plane, a Beechcraft Model 390, was traveling from Lagawi to Selangor and was attempting to land when it crashed. 
It has been shocking to many Pakistanis living in the eastern city of Jaranwala, where a Muslim mob vandalized and torched several churches and houses belonging to the city's Christian settlement on Wednesday, prompting paramilitary troops to be deployed to the scene. The attack took place in Jaranwala in the industrial district of Faisalabad, where two Christians were accused of blasphemy. Police said the men and their family members fled their homes before the attack. As of today, security personnel and had cordoned off the city's Christian colony, blocking all entry and exit points with barbed wire. The government says over a hundred people suspected to have been involved in the rioting have been arrested and an inquiry ordered into the incident. Staying with yesterday's incident in Pakistan, police patrolled the city of Jaranwala. We understand later in the day, Muslim residents protested against the delay in the arrest of those suspected to have committed the blasphemy. Police say the case against Christians relate to pages of the Quran found with some derogatory remarks written in red. The U.S. State Department has called on Pakistani authorities to call for calm following the attacks. Deputy spokesperson Vedant Patel says the U.S. supports peaceful freedom of expression and the right to freedom of religion and belief for everybody. We are, are deeply concerned uh, that churches and homes were targeted uh, in response to uh, a reported Quran desecration in Pakistan. Uh, we support peaceful freedom of expression and the right uh, to freedom of religion and belief for everybody. Um, and as we have previously said, we are always concerned of incidents of religiously motivated violence. Violence or the threat of violence is never an acceptable form of expression. And we urge Pakistani authorities to conduct a full investigation into these allegations and call for calm for all of those involved. And Voice of America's correspondent in Islamabad, Sarah Zaman, joins us now. Uh, Sarah, assalamu alaikum. Explain from the top how this attack, if we can even call it that, happened. Uh, salam. And uh, so the, the police reports that have been, uh, you know, uh, lodged so far, they say that between 9 and 10 a.m. Uh, Wednesday morning, uh, suddenly there were announcements being made from a couple of area mosques. Uh, in which people were being told that an incident like this has happened, that desecrated pages of the Quran have been found, and that people must gather and respond to it. And in Pakistan, this is an extremely sensitive issue. Blasphemy, any allegation of blasphemy becomes, uh, it, it very quickly, uh, you know, begins to get reaction from people. And it's very, uh, mostly it's seen that the a mob gathers very quickly. And that's what happened. People began to, according to police reports, gather very quickly with sticks and stones and other you know things and so with the instigation of some people who were announcing from the mosque loudspeakers and also some people in the crowd the mob became very charged and that's when they went and began to uh, damage and began to attack properties owned by christians uh, including homes and churches sarah muslims are usually quite sensitive to issues like this is it certain the christian men knew what they were doing because they were accused of blasphemy so we don't know if they actually did this or not, because this is so far an, a case of alleged blasphemy. Uh, we don't know whether those pages that were found were really found with any desecrated, any desecration and whether it was done by really these two individuals uh, who were at least blamed uh, by the instigators about for this uh, incident. And those two men are in hiding right now. So there's really no way of knowing until there is a, an, a thorough investigation and court proceedings that actually uh, squarely put the blame on someone. So right now it's extremely premature to say uh, if there was any understanding of what was going on because you know we can't really say they knew what they were doing because we don't know if they actually even did it or not. I just want to clarify something you said. I wanted to ask you, where are the men now? And you're saying that they are in hideout and nowhere to be found? Yes, they're in hiding right now, yes. So Pakistan is officially an Islamic republic, but authorities have arrested suspects in this incident. Why is that? So basically, even though Pakistan is an Islamic Republic, there are also laws and the, the constitution also calls for the protection of rights of minorities. And there are laws uh, in Pakistan that call for protection of religious spaces uh, that belong to other religions uh, other than uh, Muslims. So therefore, this is not really a question of, you know, 
uh, non-Muslims living in a country that's not theirs or a society uh, where, where their presence is not acknowledged. It's a different issue that even though they are part of this country, they're part of this society, that there are always tensions and that uh, they do become the target of such allegations. Uh, but as far as the arrest is concerned, the arrests have happened because of the violence that occurred and the charges that have been levied against uh, the people who were part of the mob, the people who were engaging in this violence. Uh, there are various charges against them. There are charges of terrorism. There are charges of uh, desecrating religious spaces. Uh, there are also charges of uh, simply misuse of the loudspeakers. Uh, so there, are, there is a long list of charges against these people because many of the actions that they took uh, go squarely against Pakistan's laws. And before this debacle, if you will, what was the relationship between Pakistani Christians and Muslims? So Pakistan is about a 97% Muslim country. So Muslims are a heavy, heavy majority and people of other religions make up a very small minority. But still, when you go to different communities, people do live side by side and yet they have very separate lives. So even though in these communities you see Muslims and Christians uh, living nearby, but you also see that most of the houses of Christians are on one street and majority of the people who live on that street would be Christians. So there's also these uh, sort of subtle uh, boundaries between uh, people. Now, uh, you know, when, when there are special occasions like Eid or like Christmas, uh, people do exchange uh, presents in some cases. They would engage, you know, uh, exchange sweets in, in some cases. So there is interaction for sure. But there are also these underlying religious, uh, I wouldn't call them tensions, but at least, uh, you know, these, uh, these sort of weak points uh, that can also get exploited very, very easily and very, very quickly. And like I said, blasphemy is an extremely a sensitive issue in Pakistan and uh, it bears uh, reminding over here that in Pakistan there are as many Muslims if not more than non-Muslims who are accused of blasphemy who are in jails right now on blasphemy charges so even though blasphemy charges are also very routinely misused according to a lot of different uh, you know NGOs and human rights groups uh, these these laws are misused uh, because there's a lot of room for them to be misused in the way they are written. Uh, but the fact is that it's not just non-Muslims who become a target. Muslims also frequently become target of these accusations. And can you give us an idea of what the situation is now in Pakistan? What's the temperature the like? In Right. So the situation in Pakistan is normal, but as far as that city is concerned, as far as the town of Jarawala is concerned, it's of course the situation over there is still tense. There is a very, very heavy police presence. There's also a heavy presence of uh, paramilitary troops known as rangers. And the caretaker uh, chief minister of Punjab has not only condemned this incident, but he has promised that he's going to get the properties restored within three to four days. However, that is, that is uh, you know, it, it remains to be seen if something uh, of such a mass level can be just cleaned up in three to four days. We've also seen that the, uh, the chairperson of the Pakistan Clerics Council, which is a council of Muslim clerics of Pakistan, that uh, person has also come out and issued a condemnation. Uh, the chief, the caretaker chief minister also held a religious uh, harmony uh, meeting, uh, a little conference today. Uh, with uh, Christian community members, Christian uh, pastors and other leaders. So on a government level, we see that there are efforts to mend fences, to patch this thing up, to also lower down the tensions. But the fact is that in that area, tensions are still running high. And a visible sign of that is the very heavy police presence. All right. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was Sarah Zaman, our correspondent for Voice of America in Islamabad. And to the West Bank now, dozens of people attended the funeral today of a Palestinian gunman who was killed by Israeli forces during a raid that set off clashes in the flashpoint town of Jenin. The 32-year-old was a senior operative with Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, an armed wing of President Mahmoud Abbas's Fatah movement. According to the Israeli military, soldiers came under fire and shot back during a mission to arrest suspected members of the Iranian-backed Islamic Jihad faction. A gun and a dozen bombs were also captured in the operation during which a soldier was lightly wounded. Violence in the West Bank has worsened over the past 15 months with stepped-up Israeli raids, Palestinian street attacks and assaults by Jewish settlers on Palestinian villages. 
Israel captured the West Bank, which Palestinians hope will form the core of a future independent state in a 1967 war. It is among the territories where the Palestinians seek to establish a state. To other news now, the world's longest rail tunnel has been shut to passenger services after a derailment in Switzerland caused damage that will take months to prepare. Authorities say there was no indication when the Gotthard Base tunnel would reopen. Sixteen wagons derailed and are still stuck inside a week after the incident on 10th of August. An investigation is being led by the Swiss Transportation Safety Investigation Board, STSB, and the Public Prosecutor's Office of the Canton of Ticino. SBB said that in total, around 8 kilometers of track and 20,000 concrete sleepers needed to be replaced. Opened in 2016, the Gotthard Rail Link took 20 years to build and cost more than $12 billion. National Swiss Rail Operator SBB Chief Executive Vincent Ducot said on Wednesday that Gotthard was one of the safest tunnels in the world. And coming up after the break, Hawaii residents in Maui hopeful President Biden's visit will bring the necessary relief following devastating wildfires. Stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, let's check in on the aftermath of the wildfires in Maui, Hawaii. The emergency management chief, Herman Andea, has defended his agency's decision against sounding sirens during the deadly wildfires, amid questions about whether doing so might have saved lives. He said sirens in Hawaii are used to alert people to tsunamis. Using it during the fire, he says, might have led people to evacuate towards the danger. Hawaii State Governor Josh Green has also defended the decision not to sound sirens. He has ordered the state attorney general to conduct a comprehensive review of the emergency response that would bring in outside investigators and experts, clarifying that the review is not a criminal investigation in any way. The sirens, as I had mentioned earlier, is used primarily for tsunamis, and that's the reason why many of them are found, almost all of them are found, on the coastline. The public is trained to seek higher ground in the event that the siren is sounded. In fact, on the website of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, the following guideline is provided. If you are in a low-lying area near the coastline, evacuate to high grounds. Had we sounded the siren that night, we were afraid that people would have gone Malka. And if that was the case, then they would have gone into the fire. And so that is the reason why our protocol has been to use WEA and EAS. By the way, I should also note that there are no sirens, Malka, or on the mountainside, where the fire was spreading down. In this case, our internal protocol is to use WEA, which is the Wireless Emergency Alert System, and the EAS, the Emergency Alert System. WEA sends alerts to, uh, by text messages to cellular phones, and the EAS are, sends messages to both television and radio. Uh, so I tasked the Attorney General to do that. She's bringing in outside support as well. There's been some question about whether it could be done independently. The answer is yes. She has state, uh, stated to me from the beginning that that was one of the purposes. She'll, of course, review what she can, uh, but we will bring outside uh, reviewers also. It's not a criminal investigation in any way. So the question is just around clarifying the, the body count or the, the death toll. Uh, where we are in general, 110 individuals. Um, have been confirmed deceased. Uh, we'll get some details about this from our, our distinguished leaders in police and fire. 110 is the number, 38% is the area searched. We have set up what's called the MINT, the Morgue Investigation and Notification Task Force with our local and federal agencies so that we can do these identifications right and proper, that we can use investigative needs and uh, means and measures with our partners so that we can make sure that we're finding who our loved ones are. Meanwhile, the Federal Emergency Agency FEMA Administrator Deanna Criswell says the White House has approved a request for a full reimbursement for 30 days of wildfires related emergency work. She says she was in a meeting in the Oval Office during which the governor was called and informed of the decision. 
The fire, which caught residents by surprise, destroyed 2,200 buildings and caused an estimated $5.5 billion in damages. Uh, as you just heard, I did just finish uh, briefing the president in the Oval Office to give him an update on the ongoing uh, recovery efforts that are um, happening in Hawaii. Um, and I will continue to provide him updates as we continue this response in support of the state of Hawaii. While I was in there, he had an opportunity to call Governor Green and let him know that he has approved the governor's request for 100% reimbursement for the emergency work that's being done for a period of 30 days within the first 120 days at the governor's choosing. Um, but, I, you know, one of the things that I really need your help on, it's not as much as lack of communication and cell phone capability, um, it's lack of understanding whether they should or should not apply for federal aid. And we want everybody in Hawaii to know that they should apply for federal assistance. And if they haven't, we'll have people that will be going out into the communities, that they're in the shelters, they'll be at the DRC. They should start that process and we can work with them to start their road to recovery. For residents of the town of Lahaina, many are looking forward to receiving much-needed aid. An outpouring show of donations and medical supplies from across the globe has been rendered to the communities that are ravaged. Community-led initiatives across the west side of the island have ramped up to deliver food, water, and clothing to many who have lost everything in the flames. You know, it's gone, a lot of people are going to react differently about the president coming here, but so a lot of people is going to leave their spirit, say, you know, saying that, oh, okay, we're important. If the president comes here, we are important and, and help is coming our way. And some other people won't care at all, but whatever, you know, we're here, we, we're all together in this and we just try to figure things out one day at a time. Any positive coming our way, we'll take it. We'll see it when he comes. We'll see it when he does it. We'll see it when he helps. A lot of talk has been going on for years and years and years. And this is just what it is, just still talking. That's, what else can I say? We've gone through a lot. We're still looking for family members. But this is important too. Everyone needs to be fed. I'm very, like I said, I'm very hopeful that him coming in will help expedite a lot of products coming in, a lot of, a lot of supplies that aren't, aren't able to make it. Like, you I mean, like, like the guys are, I found out from guys that are staying at the hotel that if it's not FEMA certified or Red Cross, they're not getting the supplies that are waiting at, outside their door. So, you know I mean, it's frustrating. People also have to be very careful of those impersonating celebrities and asking for donations. One of those celebrities calling attention to this is famous Aquaman actor Jason Momo, who posted a video on his Instagram page in which he said he was going to be reaching out to anyone on Instagram to ask for money. Momo pointed his followers to official donation pages and asked people to stay away from West Maui. I wanted to inform everyone that there has been some people on Instagram pretending to be me asking for money. Pure evil, in my opinion. I'm not gonna be reaching out to anyone on Instagram to ask for money. I am posting and reposting as much as possible to the proper places you can donate. There are links in my bios, link in the bio where you can pick different ones. But I am not reaching out to anyone asking for money, so please do not send money to these fucked up people. There's so many people are reaching out and sending their love and their prayers and asking where they can help. Right now, Lahaina underscore Ohana underscore Venmo is directly delivered to the families in need. I'm really trying to build, have my, use my platform to get out as much knowledge as I can for everyone. I know there has been a lot of people who have been bummed about me saying Maui is shut. It's been a week. We haven't even found all the bodies. 
it's pretty horrific. Um, listen, no one needs to be in West Maui. I'm not going. I'm. I'm trying. I want to go so bad. And what I can do is give love, raise money from afar. And right now, I don't even need to be in there. My friends and family are there. So as far as I'm concerned, and I think everyone that I've talked to, West Maui, we can be sending things in to help them and help. Um, like I just said to these different donations, um, there is something beautiful happening on Big Island, Oahu. We're going to be uh, some musicians and artists are getting together and all the proceeds will be going to these families. I think it'll be happening on the 19th. There's one on the 20th, Maui Ola Foundation, and that'll be on the Big Island, I think, from 10 to 4 and then on Oahu from 5 to later. Um, it's a wonderful way to get together, bring our love together, hug, kiss, share stories, and, uh, and be together and not be in the way for people in Maui. And over in Canada, several hundred fires were seen still burning in Northwest Territories as the country endured its worst wildfire season with more than 1,000 active fires burning across the nation. The hamlet of Enterprise near the Alberta border was almost entirely destroyed by a blaze that swept through on Sunday, August 13. Video footage and photos shared on social media on Tuesday showed forests of trees burnt bare by the fires. Local media reports that the mayor of Enterprise, Michael St. Amor, said between 85 to 90 percent of the community was gone after the wildfires. And in Spain, residents of La Esperanza uh, on Tenerife have been watching as a wildfire which broke out in a mountainous national park on the Spanish islands in the Atlantic left them under a precautionary lockdown on Thursday, while other municipalities had to be evacuated, leaving thousands temporarily homeless. The fire's perimeter expanded to 31 kilometers across dry woodland, covering both flanks of steep ravines near the Mount Tady volcano, Spain's highest peak hampering access to the area and covering much of the island with smoke clouds and ash. The fire, which broke out on Wednesday, has burned through 2,600 hectares of land, and while some villages were evacuated out of precaution, residents and a few others were ordered to stay home, affecting a further 3,500 people. Civil Protection removed 1,294 people from their homes in the municipality of El Rosario and 1,525 from areas of La Hortava on Thursday, with total evacuations reaching 3,800 people and more still being carried out. Defense chiefs in ECOWAS say the bloc stands ready to intervene militarily in Niger if diplomatic efforts to reverse the coup there fails. ECOWAS Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security, Abdel Fattah Moussa, has accused the junta that deposed President Mahmoud Mohamed Mazoum of playing cat and mouse with the bloc by refusing to meet with envoys and seeking justifications for the takeover. They are pretending, you know, that, oh, now they are ready for talks. But even us, they are telling us that they are ready, ready for talks. They are still seeking reasons, reasons to uh, justify an unjustifiable coup d'etat. Let no one be in doubt that if everything else fails, the valiant forces of West Africa both the military and the civilian components are ready to answer to the call of duty. By all means available, constitutional order will be restored in the country. And this meeting today, best testimony to that. What they forget is that ECOWAS is a rules-based organization. We have our protocols, we have our norms, and we are ready to protect them. That's why the heads of state are saying, if uh, push comes to show, we are 
going into Niger with our own contingent, contingent owned equipment. We are going with our own resources and to make sure that we, stop, we restore constitutional order. A Libyan factional commander whose seizure triggered the worst fighting in Tripoli for years, with 55 killed and 146 wounded, was returned to his unit on Wednesday, according to the commander's organization. Mahmoud Hamza, head of the powerful 444 Brigade, was seized by the Special Deterrence Force on Monday as he tried to travel from Tripoli's Mitigal airport, which the SDF controls. Under a deal brokered by city elders, the SDF late on Tuesday handed Hamza over to a third faction, the Stabilization Support Apparatus. That group released him to the Triple Four Brigade late on Wednesday. Pictures sent by one of the Triple Four Brigade officials showed Hamza in his uniform hugging fellow fighters upon his return. Members of the force fired guns into the air on Wednesday evening as news of his expected release was reported. Fighting broke out between the SDF and 444 Brigade across the capital late on Monday after Hamza's capture. The death toll from the fighting was announced on Wednesday by Tripoli Health Authorities, which also said 146 people had been injured. Ahead of that, seven political parties in the country are trying to form a coalition with the aim of dislodging the ruling African National Congress, ANC, from power. Dubbed the multi-party charter for South Africa or the Moonshot Pact, the gathering aims to unite similar-minded opposition parties for a series of discussions for two days at Emperor's Palace in Johannesburg, South Africa. Our South African correspondent, Innocent Samosa reports. ...holds a historical significance. On October 25, 1991, notable figures such as Nelson Mandela, Chris Hani and Helen Joseph, among other prominent freedom fighters, gathered at this very venue in Compton Park to initiate discussions for a democratic South Africa. Today, a group of opposition parties are here and they say they are gathered to save South Africa's democracy from the ruling African National Congress. Overseeing the conversation is Professor William Gomete, a respected authority in public policy, economics and mediation. You know, um, negotiations like this is um, very robust, it's been a very robust um, engagement. Um, it's going very well. Um, so the context that it is robust, but it's going very well. I think um, some very um, some breakthroughs. Party leaders says the success of this gathering could mark a pivotal moment in the nation's history. Today we meet in this historic venue to press a reset button for our country. South Africa is on the verge of becoming a failed state. And the outcomes of the next two days of discussions need to be judged based on whether they provide concrete solutions to improve the lives of South African people. If they speak to one of the unemployed South Africans in South Africa. We have been let down by those whom we regarded to be the most credible and the most knowledgeable leaders. But here, we want to say we are capable collectively and individually to rise to the occasion. As far as the Freedom Front Plus is concerned, our next crossroad or historical moment is 2024. It will not be the last one, uh, and it is also not the first one. Well, some political parties have raised concerns about the Democratic Alliance possibly forming a super coalition with the African National Congress. However, the DA refuted these claims. Well, I had a chat with the leader of Action SA, Helman Mashaba. In fact, I asked him whether or not he trusts the Democratic Alliance, and this is what he had to say. 
No, I think uh, this is part of the discussions that we are going to have the next uh, two days. I think one cannot uh, uh, preempt. Uh, we obviously hope uh, for us as Action SA, I can speak for Action SA, Action SA has made it really very clear. Our voters, uh, our supporters have given, including Senate uh, two days ago, have, they've given us uh, marching orders. Uh, no ANC anywhere near, 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 near us. Quite loud at this event is the absence of the Economic Freedom Fighters, which is the third largest political party in South Africa. This creates uncertainty about the party's alignment. For the next two days, participating parties will engage in talks to formalize the terms and the agreements with a hope to shape the direction of their potential coalition. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Six, Channels Television News. Still ahead on the program, war or not, Ukrainians in Odessa take to the beaches, open for the first time since the start of the Russian invasion. Stay with us. Welcome back. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is on his way to Camp David in the United States for a summit with U.S. and South Korean leaders. The meeting holds this Friday with U.S. President Joe Biden and South Korean President Yoon Suk-yeol and provides an opportunity to deepen ties between the three countries. Commenting on the timetable for the release of the controversial advanced liquid processing system, treated water from the tsunami-stricken Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, Prime Minister Fumio Kishido says no decision has been made. He made the comment before boarding a Japanese government plane at Tokyo's Haneda Airport. And 17-year-old Princess Leonor of Spain today resumed at a military academy in Zaragoza to undergo three years training. The princess will receive her first year training at the Army Military Academy in Zaragoza, then go to a naval school and finish her studies at the General Air Academy which includes sailing the Juan Sebastian Elcano training tall ship. The government and the royal house have agreed her very intense military training will precede university studies, following the footsteps of her father in the 1980s. Spain's lower house of parliament has elected socialist Francina Armengol as its speaker with the backing of other parties whose votes will be needed to form a socialist-led coalition government after no party secured a majority in the July snap election. The candidacy for speakership of Armengol, a former leader of the Catalan-speaking Balearic Islands region, secured 178 votes in favor of the 350 votes cast and was seen as a nod to Catalan parties who support Sanchez's needs to renew his term as premier. The Catalonia party's deal with the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party could signal its willingness to back acting Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez's bid for a new term following an inconclusive national election last month. The Conservative People's Party won more seats than the Socialists in July but did not secure an outright majority and seems to lack sufficient support to form a government. In other news, an Australian court has found Hillsong Church founder Brian Houston not guilty of concealing sexual abuse his father committed against a young male in the 1970s. Australian police in 2021 charged him with failing to report the sex abuse by his father, Frank Houston, an allegation Brian Houston strenuously denied before stepping down from ministry responsibilities last year. Judge Gareth Christoffi said the younger Houston had a reasonable excuse for not reporting the matter and believed that the victim did not want it reported to police, according to media reports. The court rejected charges that Houston covered up the abuse to protect the church's reputation, saying he spoke openly about his father's crimes. I've been found not guilty today, but in fact, I've always been not guilty. I'm going to express my sadness to Brett Sensop, genuine sadness about what my father did to him and all his victims. He was obviously a serial pedophile. We probably will never know the extent of his pedophilia. And uh, a lot of people's lives have been tragically hurt. And for that, I'll always be very sad. But I'm not my father. 
British broadcaster Michael Parkinson, best known for interviewing some of the world's biggest celebrities on his long-running eponymous chat show, has died. He was aged 88. Affectionately known as Parky, Parkinson estimated he had interviewed more than 2,000 guests in total, including high-profile names such as Muhammad Ali, Elton John, John Lennon, the Beckhams, Michael Caine, and Madonna. Born on March 28, 1935 in Yorkshire in northern England, the son of a miner, Parkinson left school at the age of 16 with dreams of becoming a professional cricketer, but after a period of national service in the army, instead turned to a local newspaper journalism. After moving into current affairs television in the late 1960s, he was given his own primetime chat show, Parkinson, by the BBC in 1971. In 2013, Parkinson revealed he was receiving radiotherapy treatment for prostate cancer, but got the all clear from doctors two years later. He is survived by his wife of more than 60 years, Mary, and their three children. Amid the scorching summer heat in Japan, sales of artificial flowers frozen in blocks of ice are flourishing. A Tokyo-based company, Onodo Shoten, opened its ice flower studio last year after the COVID-19 pandemic depressed sales of its main ice wholesale business and prompted it to pivot and seek other ways to use ice. Company president Wataru Onoda said to make the displays, a large container is first filled with tap water before flowers and other decorative objects are arranged inside. The liquid is then slowly frozen over a period of around two weeks to give it a transparent look. Customers who are mostly online-based buy the ice displays to give as gifts for such occasions as birthdays, anniversaries, and Mother's Day. He says the ice eventually melts, but the recipient will be left with the flowers and other parts of the display to keep as decorations. Finally, on the program, it was swim time after a really long while for Ukrainian residents in the city of Odessa, after officials opened several beaches to swimming for the first time since the start of the Russian invasion. The government had banned bathing during air raid alerts for people's safety. The coast was also closed for the same reason, but Odessa Governor Ole Keeper said on Telegram messaging app that the decision to open the beaches was made jointly by the civilian and military administrations. The beaches would stay open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And that's all for the world today. Thanks for watching. I'm Susan Illion. See you tomorrow.